Coral Habitat Monitoring Coordinator for the Hawaii Coral Reef Initiative, but I'm not here wearing that hat tonight. So we'll, we'll be launching off on what is more of kind of my pet project that I've been working on for the last five years. And this is uh, basically every Friday night and every chance that I get, I go off shore and do these black water dives. And so we'll be, uh, I've been taking data on that. I've been collecting specimens from that. I have some specimens to show you a little bit later. I have some data to show you for now, and let's just launch off and see what we can find out. Huh? So first thing we're going to go, we're going to talk about who I am and why I'm here. We're going to talk about uh, why Kona is, I, I really enjoy working out of Kona, Hawaii, and really what it has to offer for this area. We're going to talk about this idea of kind of the pelagic notion and what, what people think might be offshore. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what I found is actually living out there and what anybody that's done a blackwater dive has seen as well. Then we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, pelagic diversity and we're going to go into some of the adaptations that the animals that we're looking at have, and especially a behavioral adaptation, a few other observations that we've made while we were out there. And then finally, we're going to be talking about uh, going through and peeking out over a lot of specimens uh, and animals and some of the strange critters that we see specifically. So uh, without further ado, I'm a dive master for Kona Honu Divers. Uh, I'm also an underwater photographer um, who's been published in a couple of places. I'm a marine biologist, um, but I've also got, uh, let's see, when I was going for my master's work, uh, I started taking part in, here you go, Neil, Kampachi <laughs> Farms' is Offshore Aquaculture Initiative, <coughs> otherwise known as Bolella. So while we were offshore looking at this, I was a diver for them. And I'll tell you, when we were working with this, the stuff that we saw out there was incredible. And of course, the, the real cool encounters with things like the oceanic white tips and the marlins and the, the fish that we raised that, that grew twice as fast as normally, but that's beside the point. Uh, the other things we saw were a lot of little gelatinous things and some invertebrates and stuff. And that really got me hooked uh, as far as I started asking the question, how can I see more of this? Um, so that just kind of sets the stage. What we're looking at here, you all recognize this. This is our home. This is Hawaii. Uh, the reason that, this, that we're conducting this sort of stuff here is two reasons, basically. We've, for one, we've got very deep water, very close to shore. So we're, lo we're looking in, that's not a very bright laser at all. This area, uh, very, very deep, very, very quickly. We're talking about, a, you lose about a thousand feet for every mile that you travel offshore. Uh, the other reason that we really enjoy working here is that we are in the lee of two of the largest mountains on earth, which means we can go far offshore, we can go and access that deep water, and we don't have any wind when we get out there. And if you know anything about drift diving, out of a boat, wind is your enemy. So that, that means that 90% of the time we can go out there and have no real issues um, and just drift along with the boat without a problem. So what most people think we're going to see when we're out there is a lot of the stuff that, um, that we connect with. This is, this is how we all connect with the ocean, you know, through whales when we go out on whale watching trips. Or you think of sharks, you know, or you think of, um, you know, Bigger whale sharks or even marlin, you know, we, we eat, so we, we like to eat fish. And so we go out there and we catch fish like marlin and ahi, and we think the ocean is full of this big stuff, when in reality, it's not. So we go out and we explore, we're, we're just drifting along on the ocean surface with the boat, we drop down, and we look at this. These are all, you can really break apart what we're looking at into three real communities. At the top, you've got what's called Nuston. These are animals that live at the air sea interface, like the, um, we're talking flying fish. We're talking seahorses. You, you can talk about uh, Portuguese man of war, all that kind of stuff. Now, underneath those, <coughs> you've got this epipelagic zone that has a whole bunch of creatures that are very perfectly clear. During the day, you've got another community of animals that live very, very deep. These are called mesopelagic. Uh, mesopelagic vertical migrators. These are going to be much more solid-bodied animals. These are animals that can, uh, they use the cover of darkness to hide from visual predators. So every night, they have to come up to the surface to feed on all of that epipelagic stuff that's up there. And that's when we really try and hit this. So we can get this blending of these plankton and the mesopelagic stuff and the newstone all at the same time. And that's, that's the real draw. So you, not a lot of sharks, not a lot of big marlin, but when we do see a marlin, they're more like this size. So when we see something like a, a forceps fish, it's not going to look like this. It's going to look like this. And when we see something like a, like a yellow tang, again, it's going to look very, very different. So these are 
we've got this blending of communities, not just in the ecologic zone, but we also have all of those reef animals are giving birth to something that's going to develop offshore and all of the deep water animals as well. And we're going to focus a little bit about that a little bit later on in the talk. So anyway, now we get to start talking a little bit more about what we've been doing. And see, since we've been noticing that these things are the little stuff, uh, and that's the real focus, we really wanted to start developing our uh, a study, something that we could look at this. You see, up until about 10 years ago, uh, our methods for studying this stuff was limited. And so having access to, uh, to an in situ observational uh, situation like this, we figured we needed to come up with some sort of methodology to quantify. So the way that we do these is we drop down <coughs> some down lines, we attach some divers and some weights, and they just kind of dangle and we drift, right? And we drift through all of these animals. Well, we had to develop our methodology around that because that's the way that we were getting out. So our method started off um, taking the idea of an in-situ dive, something like what DAR, what NOAA does. Uh, they, what they do is they use a spatial transect, right? Well, there's no reef, there's no bottom, there's no nothing out there to lay a transect on. So instead of using a spatial transect, we started developing this idea of a temporal one. So um, instead of using uh, 100 meters long, we started dividing the dive, the 60 minute dive up into four 15 minute climbs. And by doing so, we were able to get some kind of quantification of data. Now, we did have, um, we had some other distractions while we were out there as well. We were either we're taking guests out there or we're doing, we're trying to take photos or we're collecting specimens. We had a, we're doing all kinds of things out there other than just trying to do this. This was really kind of a back seat. So we had to design this study around being able to take care of this other stuff. And so in each of those 15 minute quadrants, we only surveyed for about five minutes a piece. And that gave us 10 minutes to do all of the other stuff that we needed. And if something big popped up that we needed to deal with at that time, we just canceled the quadrant and moved on. And that was the idea. So that way we were able to uh, get some quantified data in such a way that we were able to count this stuff in a reasonable during those five minutes, we would look and we would count every animal that we observed, and you would see, I mean, obviously we cannot encompass the full breadth of the diversity of the open ocean on this tiny little data sheet, but we at least got to a start. Uh, we did 56 dives that resulted in about 217 different quadrants that we were able to survey, um, which that was over the span of two, two years, yeah, two years. So that was, we got a pretty good idea of what we were looking at that time. Now if we compare this to our traditional methodology, this is the way that plankton is usually studied. We've got things like these, uh, this is a continuous plankton recorder, and that's a plankton net. And the, there's a couple of big issues with these. Uh, one of those is the fact that they are very expensive to operate. They, they require ship time, which is very expensive. I think the Oscar Elton SETI runs at something like twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a day. So if you want to go out there and start setting plankton off of the Oscar Elton SETI, you're, you need, you're spending some big boo bucks. Uh, we were going out there just kind of in kind, uh, just going out there as guides or as buddies on a boat, just going offshore to take care of this stuff. Uh, the other thing is that these are these methodologies are very strictly biased towards very hard-bodied organisms like crustaceans and fish. <coughs> Since these have been developed in the last about 10 years, they've been developing some towed cameras or camera arrays. They're really were only effective, really starting to get effective down to the species level in the last few so it's been uh, there have been some huge advances in that, um, but that was that's been fairly recent. So let's talk about what we actually found while we were out there. So remember that pelagic notion that we were talking about with the um, with the big animals. Well, those big animals aren't represented for anything. We didn't we didn't count effectively any of those on any of our counts. Uh, what we did count. Now let's also pay attention to the idea of those hard-bodied organisms that were the focus of pretty much all of the studies prior, or most of them. Those account, these are the only real hard-bodied organisms that would have been counted in things like the continuous plankton sampler. So they were grossly underestimating the bulk, the main biomass of what is actually out there. So uh, that was one of the big things that we found, and we knew that. We knew that going into this, that this was going to be a pretty good idea of what we were going to be finding. This is the gelatinous stuff. Um, but so for every one fish that we saw, we found we counted three hydromedusa, we counted four mollusks, we counted four different crustaceans, we counted five tenophores, 
kind of nine salps. So in other words, the fish biomass was very small compared to the other stuff. The hard body biomass was very small compared to the other stuff. But we want to go a little bit deeper and we want to start asking the questions of why, um, why is this stuff showing up when it's showing up? So we started looking at what is impacting the biodiversity of the communities that we're seeing out there. And so we started off by just kind of a shotgun approach and uh, developing something called a generalized additive model. And the way these things work is a it's a very complicated um, uh, mathematical <coughs> equation where when you plug in all of these independent variables and you compare them to your dependent variable of, in this case, biodiversity, then it'll spit out which one of these are statistically significant in impacting your dependent variable. But the problem is, when you look at these, there are some of them that have a little bit of interplay. And when you're talking about a GAM, like what we were developing, um, the interplay of like how season impacts your water temperature, for example, or how uh, the you know, water temp is also impacted by the ENSO events or the North Pacific gyre oscillations of your eddies. When you've got that kind of interplay, it really confuses the, the model. Uh, so you have to do some smoothing <coughs> of your variables. And what we ended up getting was basically five variables that we found that weren't interplaying with each other <coughs> very much at all. And so we're looking at water temp. We're looking at ENSO, which is your El Nino impact. So that's, uh, we all know what that is. Survey depth, at which depth we were surveying. Uh, the bathymetry underneath of us um, and the lunar phase. So let's start delving into this. These were the three real significant um, findings that we found. These were the most important aspects impacting the diversity from uh, offshore. Water temp, ENSO events, and bathymetry. So the thing with this bathymetry model, or this bathymetry curve, is you notice that there's a peak right around 1,500 meters. And this was, this was interesting to us because nobody had ever really looked at this and noticed a diversity peak at around that depth. And what I found was I started going through the nautical charts and noticing that if you measure the distance between the two of them, and so we're looking at the distance between the two, the two points on a nautical chart, and you look at the change in depth, you basically get a slope. And we found that the slope in the shallower water was somewhere around 400 meters of depth for every kilometer you traveled offshore. If you, as you went deeper than 1,500 meters, you started getting this plateaued out. So basically that 1,500 meters is where the island started to kind of slope out and start to go <coughs> off. Not quite to the bottom of the ocean, but that's where it really gradually starts to go. So that's interesting. And we're still working with some of this data, so this is, we're still working with this. Temperature, for example, uh, I don't know what's going on here exactly. We've got a pretty strong curve. Uh, we've got a peak at about 25.5, which isn't as warm as it tends to get in the summer. And that tells me that what we're looking at here is the shoulder seasons. Spring <coughs> and autumn um, is a high time for blackwater diversity. That was a really simple result, but it was... Uh, we've got a couple of other thoughts of things that we're looking at as well, things like um, the differences between El Nino years, um, differences in, uh, we went through seasons. Anyway, temperature is still kind of, we're still grinding it down. There it is. Um, as far as unique adaptations go, we kind of went into a few of these. For example, translucence. Uh, a lot of the fish, and we're starting to talk a little bit more about pictio diversity at this point, so these are uh, a lot of the fish adaptations were my kind of specialties. Um, a lot of these animals are turning themselves perfectly clear, so they start looking like swimming airstreams. Here's a flounder. A lot of these animals are turning themselves perfectly reflective, therefore they're going to be reflecting back the same color of water that is ambient around them. So when you're talking about a, if you're surrounded by black, you're just going to be reflecting black back, or blue, you're going to be reflecting blue back into the eyes of your predators. These are all ways to hide against nothing. A lot of, I think 90% of open ocean animals have some form of photophores attached to them. Now we've, we're looking at a mctophid here, um, but there's a lot of them out there. So mctophids are wonderful because they have this, these photophores, you can tell them apart by species based on that pattern of photophores alone. But there's a lot of other reasons why you might want 
lightning emitting organs. It's things like our cookie cutter shark. Cookie cutter sharks use lightning emitting organs to attract bigger animals to them so that they can swim around their mouths and bite them as they swim. So that's kind of a way to attract animals to them, mimicry, mimicking a smaller animal, something that might be prey. Communication, we talked a little bit about mctophids, other mctophids can communicate in other ways as well uh, amongst each other using those photophores. This is one of my favorites, counter-illumination, this animal here that's called Megalocrankia fischeri. Megalocrankia is a, um, it's a big squid called a glass squid. These guys get up to like three meters long. Uh, I really love this photo because you can actually see the optical nerve going onto the eyeball. But what, uh, what is really striking about these animals to me is how perfectly clear they are. I, this photo doesn't quite capture exactly how clear they are when you see them in the water, but they have these two very solid structures here in their eyeballs. So as most predators hunt up, so they look up as they're hunting, and as this guy drifts over top, that hunter, whatever predator it is that's going after it, would see two <coughs> little black orbs blot out the moonlight as it goes over top of them. Well, what this guy has done is he's evolved to have light emitting organs underneath of his eyes that are actually going to match the moon's luminance perfectly. So if it's a full moon out, those are going to be a lot brighter than if it's a new moon out. So that it can actually detect how much ambient light is around and change the luminance coming out of those to match it. Cool stuff. Uh, there are a number of other unique adaptations, things like nematocysts. We all know what nematocysts are. If you've been stung, that's a thing. Um, <laughs> they hurt. Siphonophores, any, any nigerian is going to have them. Siphonophores and cubizones and uh, hydromedusa and scyphomedusa, they'll have, all have some form of nematocyst. But what you probably don't realize is there are lots of other animals that will use those nematocysts as a defense mechanism. Here's a phylosome. Um, they, that's a baby lobster. And they'll actually use those uh, nematocysts. Uh, not just they will eat the jelly as they drag them around, but they'll also drag them around so that anything that eats this is also going to have to dance around that, that jelly to get it. But there's a lot of other ways that we can um, start thinking about symbioses out there. In fact, all of these are forms of symbioses. Uh, we're talking about like the Karengids that are living on this. That's going to be a form of uh, commensalism. The, the jelly, the box jelly doesn't necessarily get anything out of that. But the Karengids are going to get a pretty powerful uh, uh, ally in their defense on the way to maturation. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the octopus was doing here, other than I think it was just hiding on the seahorse as I was passing by. But uh, I know that the seahorse did not care for that, but there are all sorts of forms of symbiosis out there. Uh, just like on the reef, uh, you have the cleaner shrimp and the, or the cleaner fish and the larger fish, or you have the, the clownfish and the anemone. Offshore, we have the same forms of symbiosis as well. But some of the really fun communities that I really enjoy watching uh, survive, uh, revolve around these man of war. Now, when you're looking at a man of war um, at the surface, imagine that there are other things that are also trying to use these things. So, for example, here we've got a couple. We've got a couple of Glaucus species. This is Glaucus atlanticus, Glaucus marginatus. They are going to consume the man of war, but they, they don't just rely on the man of war for sustenance. <coughs> They're also going to consume those nematocysts and then express them on the outsides of their body. So, if something goes to eat this, it's going to get stung. But that's not the only animal that's going to use their nematocysts. We're also looking at something like this young Tremoctopus. See, Tremoctopus, it's a blanket octopus. They get up to about six feet. And in between their tentacles, they have these membranes. That's why they call them blanket octopus. And when they get disturbed, they rip those membranes off, and then they use those to kind of get away. Well, Tremoctopus as a paralarva is going to follow around these man war at the surface. And when something comes by and threatens them, it's going to pluck off a tentacle and whip it around like a whip. So it's a defensive whip. Um, I can tell you it hurts when you get hit by those because it's happened. It's no fun. You can laugh about it. That's fine. <laughs> um, fish, and we've been talking about some of these associations so far, but there are a number of relationships out there that are very, very well known. Uh, gadids are very well known for cohabitating with various nidarians. Same thing with karangids and nomeids and coryphenids, etc., etc., etc. Lots of them are all over the, the literature. But what they didn't know was about this little guy. I, actually, Sarah found this first. Uh, she was on a blackwater dive um, and found, she came home and she was just screaming about this little fish that was sitting on a ball. 
Uh, and I said, no, you're nuts. That's, that ball has a name. Well, we, we finally went out and we got one, and we brought it back, and we sent it off to our friend at the Smithsonian. Uh, and he was able to identify the little fish. That's a type of comfort called a bramid. Um, we still have yet to get an identification on what specifically that ball is. Uh, but we found them again. But the funny thing is with these, it's not just the their balls that we're worried about. It's, it's other things as well. <laughs> pardon the language. But they, um, we're also talking about uh, they'll associate with salps and they'll associate with narcomedusa, which is, it seems, of course they will. They're looking for something to associate with. But even though the scientists, the people bringing up trolls, had found bramids inside of oozoids before, uh, they had found bramids mixed in with all these gelatinous stuff. As we were discussing a moment ago, those plankton trolls mix everything up and tear up all the gelato. So they didn't, there, it's not uncommon to find fish sitting inside of bells that didn't belong there in the first place. So they never actually knew that, that bramids are associating with any of these. They just figured that they were just drifting around in the open ocean. So in other words, this is a, a note that will be coming out actually very soon. I, but part of the problem is trying to figure out what exactly this, the nature of this relationship is. Um, are we talking about a parasitic relationship where the fish is nibbling at the, at the narcomedosoid? Are we talking about a cleaner relationship where the bramid is uh, cleaning epiphytes off the outside of it? Or are we talking about an associative relationship whereby any predator coming by is going to have to open its up, mouth up big enough to swallow both of those things in order to get at the uh, fish? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you later when I figure it out. <laughs> if I figure it out. <coughs> but, I mean, as we're kind of getting on here, uh, we're going to... I'm just going to point out that in addition to making notes on observation, in addition to taking notes on what we've been seeing, I've also been, uh, when we see something really interesting, we, we pick it up and we, we put it in one of these. And so I'm going to pass these around. Um, I had a couple of neat slides that I that unfortunately didn't make it through the process of computers here. Uh, those are the new ones. But I'm going to pass these around. These are little um, fishies that we've, which are barbel fish that we've collected from Blackwater. Uh, from various areas. Uh, they're preserved in ethanol, and these are various kinds. We're looking at a couple of different ones right now. Please don't open them. Please don't open them. <laughs> please make sure that they find them in there. But there's alcohol on them, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can have a sip, Mark. Just a sip. Um, we're talking about things like this. I, I don't think I put one of these in there. We have a few of these on. Dragonfish, stomiids. I love stomiids. When we find one of these, they're really, really cool for a few reasons. I mean, they have these googly eyes. That's really cool. But um, they also have this uh, external anus. And I get to use that in public when I talk about them, external anus. Um, that's, a, that's a long digestive tract that just helps them eke every last little bit of nutrients out of their food particles when they get them. Now, one of the really cool things about dragonfish that I just recently learned, they actually emit light in the red spectrum, which deep sea fishes can't see. Stomiids can. So basically by emitting this red light and being able to see this red light, that gives them their own private communication channel that they can not only communicate amongst each other, but they can actually shine red light out enough that they can shine off of another prey item and have that prey item be completely clueless that this guy's in there. <laughs> I think that's kind of neat. Anyway, you're not looking at any of these because I didn't bring them, so there you go. <laughs> um, yes? How big are they All right, this guy is going to be about that big. Little <coughs> tiny guy. Lamprogrammus, uh, this is exhibiting that same elongated gut structure, but instead of being um, the, the, the ventral end, the tail end, this is actually more connected directly to the mouse. So this is going to be an elongated foregut elongated foregut, basically, um, that's going to help this guy uh, extract every last little bit of nutrients from that food, food item. <laughs> Furthermore, we're also looking at a number of long filaments and things, and those filaments are going to do a couple of things for it. it. It can be a form of mimicry, so it can look like something like a siphonophore, something that will sting. Um, but the other thing that those long filaments are going to do is they're going to help keep the animal at the surface by um, increasing the surface area to body mass of this animal. So it creates an awful lot of drag, so it doesn't have to expel a lot of energy in something like a swim bladder or swimming upwards to stay up near the surface. It's just got all these filaments that you have. 
similar with virtual Latinian and Nielsen I, same idea. And then we start looking at something like Carapids. Carapids, this is another animal that we're not passing on. By the way, what we are passing on, we've got a Lucio Brotula uh, in there somewhere that's going to be a, a Brotula, much like this guy, um, except he doesn't have all the frilly things. He just have, has an external gut. We also have somewhere what, what in there. Family Alpha is that? What's that? What family is that? That's an Ophidia. Uh, so it's a Cuskiel. Um, so Lucio Brotula is also a Cuskiel. Um, one of those is Malacosarcus macrostoma who the Smithsonian are the only ones that really have any specimens of that, and theirs have been preserved informally. So um, they've degraded badly over the years, so they're just like bits and pieces of fish here and there, um, but they don't have any actual DNA from them. So this will be the first DNA sample ever collected of uh, Malacus arcus. Can you go back to the previous slide? Certainly. Going on to the next one. Yeah. 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 So, distinguishing characteristics between those two. This one and this one? Okay, so you're looking at a couple of distinguishing characteristics. It, it takes a moment to kind of feel it out. Um, this guy has long filaments that go all the way down, just like two thirds of the way down his body, uh, down his dorsal fin. Lampogramus only has uh, long, elongated filaments towards uh, just over top of his head. Furthermore, Lampogramus has this really elaborate stomach. Comes down, and yeah, fairly large. Rotulitania has an external stomach, but it's going to be much much smaller. Um, other than that, there almost is, looks like a detached epithelium. Um, on this one, no, the second one. Right. Here we go. It almost looks like the epithelium has been peeled off. Oh, like <laughs> almost. Yeah, pretty close. So that's his gut. Yeah, that's his gut. Not mm -hmm. the epithelium. Um, so, carapids have, have kind of cauterized as well, and there, there's a couple of reasons for this. One, um, there was, we've now seen three specimens of this. Uh, we have yet to be able to, to get any kind of a feel for it because they're so big. And so, here's the deal with carapids. We only see larvae out there. As they grow older, they're going to lose this vexillifer. They're going to use this long, lose this long tail filament. So, this is one of the only fish out there that, as it matures, it's actually going to shrink in length. Um, so when we went out there and we found a specimen of this that was, the fish itself was every bit of about probably a foot and a half long, a half a meter, something like that. And as I'm shooting it with my camera, it's sitting out here and its vexillifer is coming way up and over and uh, down my back. We're talking about a sizable animal. The life history of these guys is such that as they mature, not only do they shrink in, in length, but they also take up residence inside the back end of a sea cucumber. <laughs> so, and they, they, many of them will parasitize the gonad. So try imagining a fish that's that long fitting inside of a sea cucumber. Now, the only thing that this did was when we, when we went to uh, the guys that actually study these things, uh, more hardcore than we do, he wrote back and said, we've had suspicions of a neotenous carapid out there for years now. Uh, neotenous means that it maintains its larval state throughout its, throughout its life history. So he's had suspicions, but he's never been able to verify that there's a neotenous carapid. So we were pretty certain, or we have a pretty good idea that we probably bumped into this guy's suspicions at one point or another. Rumors, not verified, but it's, it's kind of fun to think about. But you're probably noticing this vexillifer, and just, just another um, adaptation for these guys is the mimicry that they are able to exhibit. That's a siphonophore placed next to the vexillifer of a carapid. Um, they're very, very similar, especially when you look at them in the wild. So any predator that's going to be going after a carapid or could be going after a fish doesn't want to take in a mouthful of sting, won't, won't take the chance to test it out because he's just going to go away with just a, a mouthful of hematosis. That's not fun. Uh, this is the other one that I was trying to think of. Uh, whale fish. There is a whale fish being passed around. Pay special attention to that. Cetamimic. These guys are fantastically fascinating animals. Um, up until a few years ago, cetamimids were placed into three different families. Don't ask me to repeat what families those were. I don't remember right off the <coughs> but what I do remember 
is that they were one family was large, black, ugly, deep fish. Very, very a fat thing. Okay. One of those families was little males about this big, and they, they had all been very badly damaged by the nets that they were being brought up in, but they didn't really have much in the way of digestive tracts or anything like that. And then the other one was these guys. These are called tape tails, and they found these up near the surface, and they knew that they were all somewhat vaguely related, but they didn't know how until um, our friend was working with them. He was comparing them, went through the DNA, and he found that they were not just the same family, not just the same genus. They were all in the same species. They were, what was happening was, they started off life like a tape tail. So that's this guy with a big long filament coming off of his model. When this guy matures, he's going to have a choice. He can either become a female and become that big, ugly, fat, black blob. <laughs> or he can be a male. And when he becomes a male, he's going to digest his entire digestive system. And survived the entire rest of his life living off of nothing but the bolus of food that he ate as a tape tail. So this bolus of food becomes like a modified, highly fatty liver that sustains this animal for the rest of its life. If it mm. Yes. How long is that life? Uh, we don't know. We <laughs> have no idea what these. So a lot of these deep water animals are. No idea. Okay. <laughs> oh, bugger. I got rid of this. Anyway, a little, little quick to wrap things up here. Um, I, I, I wrap this up with, with the story of the purple back flying squid because I found this to be particularly enthralling. We see these guys a lot. Um, purple back flying squid are the most common squid that we see on black water. Uh, they, they come in in big, big schools of hundreds and hundreds of individuals you'll see as you fly by. Um, they're fascinating. They're beautiful. They come in, they, they're hunting them in coasts as well. Somebody told me recently, and I wasn't able to verify it, uh, per se, but apparently there are more squid in the ocean than fish, and I believe it after diving uh, black water for as long as I have, because we see these guys much more frequently than we see people fish. Um, so what I do know is these guys are forming the major forage base for many of our um, fishes that we're fishing for right now. Things like tuna, marlin, <laughs> swordfish, uh, marlin, swordfish, and Pantropical spotted dolphins. So mm -hmm. if you're a fisherman, you know that the pantropical spotted dolphins and the ahi are associated with one another somehow. And that association lies in the food source, and that's these purple back flying squid. Now, the reason I know that is when the purple back flying squid are around, I've seen them getting hunted by all kinds of things. Uh, snake mackerels called in the family Vinculidae, um, big, big tuna. We've seen large swordfish cruising through, um, but we very frequently see dolphins coming. In fact, we saw one, I saw one hit one one day, and this little white thing popped out. And I, I swam up to it, and as I swam up to it, it was looking back at me, and that was the squid's eyeball drifting down. And that was kind of the caliber of things that we, uh, interactions that we can see out there. But um, I had a couple of other things in the other slideshow that I can't show you guys apparently, but with that, I'd like to see if you guys have any questions, um, odd ones or otherwise. Um, we get such clear photos. What's the job? <laughs> What's the most challenging thing I'm trying to photograph? Is? Oh, Do you photograph sure. them in the field or when you collect them? The most challenging, no, in the field. Um, the most challenging thing is always the, um, the focus. Uh, a lot of these things being as clear as they are, there's not a lot of contrast to try and, uh, that your, your camera sensor can't really pick up on it very, very easily. So trying to be able to focus on this, you really do need, and I, I know these mirrorless cameras have made huge leaps and bounds lately, but they're I, not quite wait there yet. They'll, they'll get there with this. This is really the true, tried and true kind of test of a focusing system. So um, DSLR is really the way to go. Um, the other thing is obviously because you don't have a bottom, many divers really like having a bottom there to kind of associate <laughs> with. If you're, on a, if you're in black water, you don't. The, the bottom is you know, 1,500 meters beneath you. So you're talking about trying to, trying to line this thing up while just free floating with an animal that is also free floating. Those are the I'm not a photographer, but they're fantastic photos. Thank you. <clears throat> However, you can't manage that. That's a great Watch out. Practice. Practice. Practice <laughs> is a big one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Luck. Any other questions? Yes, both. Yeah, as you know, I've been out with you on these black water dives, and my question is are you still chummy? <laughs> <laughs> I know a source of chum. 
<laughs> no, I wish. Uh, no, these guys are. Um, <laughs> I don't know him. Would the cage for the cookie cutter shark saved you in Shark Again? No. Oh, God, you had a good question. <laughs> uh, yes, the question was about um, the El Nino events. Yes. So you've only, you only collected data over about 18 months or so, right? Yes, and so that was during the beginning of the El Nino. But, so, this is something that I learned going into this. Yeah. El Nino, they track El Nino based on, it's an MEI, and offhand I can't remember what specifically that stands for. Multi, and so something, something. Um, but basically they, if they don't necessarily track it over the full year, they, it's, it oscillates by month. So while so on an El Nino, on an El Nino year, your months will be uh, very very positive, whereas on a on a La Nina year, they'll be very very negative. So it's balancing around this zero value. What specifically they're measuring? Okay. Fair. Good question. Yes. Oh yeah, every pretty much every dive I come up with ten to twenty to thirty usable photos, which means that I ran into probably forty or fifty animals of some sort or another. In fact, the counts that I was looking at, uh, the average number of animals we were counting just in those five minute segments, I think we were counting an average of twenty animals every five minutes. It's it's a super. Value. What's your average depth? Is, is, um, so you're hanging off lines. Right? Yeah, maximum depth is going to be somewhere around 40 feet, uh, 40 to 50 feet. Um, your average depth is 20 feet. Sometimes you go all the way up to the surface. Sometimes you go. Um, you What's your preferred off distance offshore? Yeah, we, we usually go somewhere between what? three to five miles. If you go too far out, you start getting into, uh, you start getting out of this zone that's called the mesopelagic boundary community. An animal, that's a section of animals that are going to probably go still because they're hammered up. Um, but, and you start getting away from shore. The further you move out from the island, in general, the fewer animals oftentimes you're going to see. So, which, think about it, the highest biomass is going to be found on a reef. And then there's going to be a cloud of fish that lives over top of that reef. And then as you move out from that, you've got a zone of fish that are going to kind of be loosely associated with that reef. Um, that, that continues as you move off shore. <coughs> what would happen if you were like one mile? You'd be very close to rocks, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> the logistics of it, but. Right. Uh, the, hypothetically, you would get, so I think the mesopelagic boundary community is comprised mostly of uh, like lithophids, so lantern fish, which is what we see a lot of offshore anyway, but um, there's a lot more of them there. So you've got this really thick slug of life that comes up and stays within about a half a mile to a That it's still would that make for an interesting animal. It absolutely would. The only problem is when you're going out there. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to be on a drifting boat. It, it's you can land. drift three or four miles sometimes on a single dive, so you can't pull people out of the water fast enough That's if you're true. close to land. Yeah. Um, wow. Yes. Uh, so you troll? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if. if uh, you know, the, the currents that out there are a knot or two on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how are these animals actually staying positioned close to the island? Because you know, that, that would, that, they obviously can't swim very fast, they are pelagic. Right. Would those ones that are in that 1500 meter zone pretty quickly get whipped out? Yes. Likely for the project. And I, I think I think I was going to say it sounds like you're getting to the eddy formation that we were dealing with with Valella, and uh, the idea is as the as the trade winds meet up with the island, they're going to go around it, and where they meet, they're either going to spin one way or they're going to spin the other way, and the they carry with them the ocean currents. So one of the major drivers of the ocean currents. So uh, where are those currents coming through the Ali Nui Haha Channel? And the coming around South Point meet, they're going to go one way or the other. So those eddies entrain a lot of 
larvae with them. So it can take anywhere from three days to seven days or more for an eddy to go make a full rotation around, or for a larvae to make a full rotation around this eddy. Um, what Neil is getting at is how, how are these larvae, I think what he's trying to get at is how are these larvae able to stay near the island? And part of that has to do with that eddy Part of that has to do with the, with the larvae's ability to move. It's not going to swim against a three knot current for very, very long. But what it can do is move vertically up and down that current to catch into other currents. And so that's, that's an area of study that has been not very well elucidated. Um, but they, they have found that they can, they can travel vertically for quite some distance. And it's been hypothesized. And I think somebody actually showed that they were able to use those differing currents to kind of navigate their, their way around the ocean. Does that make sense? Yep. Sure. Awesome. Yes. Have you done any uh, daytime studies, basically, in similar areas to kind of get a baseline comparison for that vertical migration from the other? That's a great idea. Um, the only issue with that is the, the reason that we're able to see so many gelatinous things out there and the perfectly clear things is we've got these lights that are shining up, um, and those lights really reflect refract off the outside and really make it beautiful. Um, during the daytime, you try and shine a light against the light of the sun and you're, you're going to get nothing. So a lot, all this stuff is really designed to disappear during the day. Um, so trying to, without the aid of those lights, it'd be a little bit more difficult. You can still do it. Um, no, I haven't done it. Um, but that's been kind of my, my, I think, my thought process on that. Yes? Can I add to that question? So there's that vertical saying so there's more activity at certain times than others i mean they're not staying in that what did you call it that that top layer that upper flag right? eddy flag right. so they're moving up at night right. to feed and then they go back down right and so what, what's that distance that they travel cool. uh it depends on the area oh, okay. um those purple back flying squid one of the other really endearing things for these purple back flying squid is that they spend their days in zone called the oxygen minimum zone. So that's where that's where the oxygen levels very, very deep are, as the name describes, very, very, very low. So this is an animal that has a year to get born as a parallel, which is just about microscopic size, grow up to about yay long, breed, and then die. So it's spending its days in this oxygen minimum zone. So it's a highly, highly active animal that has to eat five times a day or something to survive or else it starves to death. So it's metabolizing a whole bunch of food, but it still spends its day in this oxygen minimum zone. And what it does is it actually uses that zone to shut its metabolism down, go into sort of a state of hibernation <coughs> through the day so that it can make it through the day without starving or make it through the day more easily without starving. Um, which I thought was interesting. Anyway, thousands of things, um, depending on which animal you're talking about. Uh, Candy, I Media. Uh, I, it's only in the PowerPoint. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> Which the PowerPoint is the part that I'm part of. Good thought. No, that's okay. Any other questions? Yes. In the five million five hundred fifty spider diversity samples, how many of those do we model? How many? How many data points are trying to model? We did. So we modeled this one. This was just kind of pilot, a pilot idea, uh, and we developed that generalized additive model off of two hundred and seventeen. Which, is, which was a start. That was just kind of asking the question, is this a dumb idea to continue? And the answer was probably not. We, we'd like to refine it down. We'd like to get it, um, get the, get it down to more species. Then a lot of those would come down to family, which um, trying to develop a, a data sheet that is down to species is going to be daunting. So instead, what I think we're going to do is um, go more the NOAA route, like uh, NOAA's fish survey and say, um, distill each species down to so when they encounter a species, they just write down the four letters and then they mark down approximately how many they see. And that's probably the model that we'll go with as we move forward. But right now, yeah, that's the Yes? Do you have like similar things with the pelagic where the only substrate there is to settle on are like whale bones and carry on chicken? Yes. How, I mean, I think pelagic will find so much like plastic debris. Mm -hmm. How often? How controversial do you think that is to take it away if it's oh. like dependent on that 
<laughs> that's that's a huge question, right? Like, yes. that's, uh, and it's it's always as you come across like trash in the middle of the ocean, you wonder like what is what is going on. We found uh, we came across some uh, boat that was later identified as tsunami debris, um, and it was a full hull of a boat that had been sitting and drifting around there for years since the Japanese tsunami. And underneath it, it was this cloud of trigger fish and silky sharks, and we had. There was a, a ball, a bait ball of yellowfin tuna underneath of it. Oh they were being hit with a marlin. Like it was just incredible to go and dive on this thing. But it was, um, yeah, I really wanted that boat at the same time. <laughs> 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 Where do you draw the line between it's trash or treasure? And that, that was, yeah. And when we were, when, when I was working with the Marine Debris Project for NOAA, that was the same question that we asked: was when you approach a net, is the reef overgrowing the net so much that it's you're doing more? It's really, that's a, that's a So what do you do? What was your, your best doing? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
One more deeply philosophical question. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you, you, you made a mockery of that fish with the external anus. Yes. <laughs> but how well would an internal anus work? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. One of the variables you mentioned is the lunar phase. Yes. When you've got a full moon, does that scare away a lot of these Great things? Great question. And that was that was another slide that didn't make it into this final iteration. Um, the lunar phase, you would expect, and so based on, we've got sound scattering data from from pings going down in the ocean reflecting back. And we know, we know that this, these layers of animals come up to the surface uh, from that. that was, that's called the sound scattering layer. That's that mesopelagic layer that comes up. Um, so we know that they come up a little bit shallower during the new moon, and they stay a little bit deeper during a full moon. Basically, it's not entirely accurate, but it's good enough to say that they're following the steady ISO rule up. So there, it's, the, the moonlight is going to shine in a certain luminance and then they're going to follow, so they're going to go fairly shallow during new moon. Um, we don't see that same pattern on black heart, which tells me a couple of things. We're shining around these bright, bright lights. So that means that we're creating this artificial ice ribbon around us. So the community that we're studying is a bit of an artificial community. And that's it's OK as long as you're willing to recognize it. Um, the fact that these that these animals are we're probably scaring away some of them sensitive animals, and some of the animals are probably going to be attractive to us. But furthermore, we're also divers bubbling underwater. And these are all these are all variables that I think any in-situ study has to deal with in some way or another. Um, but as long as you recognize that, and as long as you conduct each survey in the same way, you should be able to tell at least something about what you're looking at. In, the, in this case, behavior. Um, and you know, try and characterize the animals that we're observing. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody willing to fund this? <laughs> <laughs> Year that I noticed that I started really noticing the level of growth, and I don't, I don't have a quantification of that. So I'm glad to hear about that. An increase? No, I, I don't know. I, I, that's the first year that I started looking around. I'm like, I think there's a lot of larval fish around here. Um, so it's just a qualitative thing, not a quantitative thing. Okay. Yes. Frank. Since uh, it seems, you know, I didn't even know that all these you know, Greek fish actually bred or, or developed uh, out so far away. Sure. I always thought that was. I know everyone's always said it was so far away, I call it so far away, but if everything is growing in the ocean, do you think that, or is it the gyres or those uh, that are keeping the ocean away from us as well? You're getting really, really close to the answer to all of that. Um, <laughs> there, Hawaii is really, really, really far away. So everything we have here had to be recouped here, not just as an individual, but it had to come as a big enough population to create a much greater diversity that they weren't So they had to, there had to be enough animals coming here as founders to, to breed a lot. And there is, as such, there are a number of animals that are completely missing, or mostly missing, from Hawaii fauna um, across our corals for the most part. We've got a, a few on this island and a few elsewhere, but they're not many. Um, giant clams are completely gone. We, we don't have any of those. What's that? Anemones. Anemones. Yeah, we don't have any of the bigger leaf growing anemones. In other words, a lot of these animals haven't made it here. Now, part of that is the distance. Part of that is the ebb current. So the, the eddies are the big system here, but there are some major currents that circulate. There's two big gyres. There's all the way up there. There's a North Pacific gyre. There's also a South Pacific gyre. And there's, um, the animals have this larval dispersal phase window of opportunity to settle. 
So it's not, so once they reach this, this stage of metamorphosis, they, they have like, I'm just gonna pull a number out here, like a week to settle, and if they don't find anything, they just, that's it. Yeah, they die. It's free. Yes? Do you think we're gonna have like an increase of species in Hawaii due to like larger mass of these marine debris? Like uh, they are like both floating mm -hmm. around like we're talking about. And we have I remember hearing like Galapagos sharks showed up from a, a barge that was floating around. Well, Galapagos sharks also live here. So that is that is a that is a they have, like originally showed up do you think just in a barge or something like that instead of just floating for I don't know about that. Uh, and I, I hadn't heard about that particular case. I know that there are a number of um, they have traced some animals from fallen debris to landing on our shores. And that is one of the big um, worries with debris is having this huge amount of stuff drifting around in the open ocean, accumulating stuff and forming these many little microcosms. Is some of that going to come up and come ashore and, um, and sneeze new life in our, our world here? I don't know. Um, it probably will. There's, there are a few species I think that they found where they're, those are going to become invasive now. Yeah. But keep in mind, there's also been a lot of other things that have been drifting around the ocean as well. So not, not as much, but those bigger tree logs. Tree logs. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Brooks. How many other places in the world have uh, biological migrations like this on a regular basis that are easily accessible? And have you ever been able to go to those places and do that comparison research? Good question. Um, other places in the world, basically, there is a sound scattering layer, to my knowledge, in every ocean that's deep enough to have one. So you've got this, this layer of animals, basically, ocean wide that comes into the surface. You just have a particularly thick batch of animals around the Marine Park here right now, um, or around basically most islands and sea moss as well. So you've got this sound scattering layer that'll be thousands of feet down from the ocean all over the place. It's just more pronounced than that. Does that make sense? Uh, there are places, other places in the world that'll do blackwater dives. We tried doing three of them when we were in Florida, but we got weathered out. Um, Indonesia apparently will occasionally do some, Papua New Guinea, Japan. Philippines. Wow. We, did, we could do some in California. I was going to do some. I'm supposed to go to California to do some there, and I haven't had, had a chance to yet. Any other? Yes? I've been hit by them really hard. <coughs> My just, drivers got, like, impaled. Like, we had so many coming at us, just inking in our faces, and everyone was freaking out. I had a driver. <laughs> I had a driver. <laughs> Literally on Friday night, that she was freaking out, and I was helping her up to the boat. And as I'm helping her up, one came out and hit me in the chest. <laughs> <laughs> one knocked one of my diver's masks off yeah, in the yeah. blackness. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Perfect. I want you. How often do you have somebody freak out on Blackwater? Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Too often. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's really, it's funny because like you, you know them, a lot of times you know the one that's going to do it on their way in and then, yeah, that's the worst. And I hate it when they're just dragging by, by the boat, it's like the worst. The, um, and the, the predators, when they come in, they know which one it is. Oh, it's going to lose another one. <laughs> I've seen a, a few silkies, I've seen an oceanic white tip, um, two swordfish, I've seen two cookie cutter sharks, um, saw mako in February, um, a handful of others. Yeah, there's, um, I saw a 200 pound tuna go cruising through it. Mahi mahi. Uh, dolphins at Lake Hama. Mm -hmm. I see yeah. spinners and spotters. So, Janine saw a spinner on Wednesday. Uh, I've never seen a spinner out there. I've seen rough tooth dolphins. I've seen pantropical spotted. Um, she saw some beaked whales out there once. I've seen, I was on a dive where once somebody saw a pilot whale. Um, that's about it. That's all in black water? Um, yes. Black water. So I was just in. As they're pushing the, the, the people away. Yeah. I was just in Thailand helping a researcher. 
here. I have a master's in molecular biotechnology. So uh, this lady asked me to go to Thailand to take photos of box jelly for her and to uh, help her out with some of her bioassays. And while we were there, we, we were hoping to catch, uh, to catch the major Persian uh, jelly, the, the nasty box jelly that happens in Australia all over the South Pacific. And we were hoping to catch the major influx of those coming in. Um, except apparently we missed it by about a week. So we were there just a week too early. But while we were there, we did find one more block of box jelly. It was a purple one that we showed to the you know, member of slide chat. Um, and basically, we'd been there for three days. And she, she knew that I was there to, to see box jelly. So I, I, I kind of felt bad. So she was like, let's just go on a dive. And let's go, let's go blow off these peeps a little bit and have some fun. So she took me out on this dive on a wreck at Kotao. And we're down at Kotao mm -hmm. for about 20 minutes, for about 20 seconds. When the dive master goes, come here, come quick, quick, and we go over. I'm not wearing a wetsuit. I'm not wearing a hood. I had to dig the gloves out of my pocket. I'm wearing board shorts, um, and I go over, and it's a box jelly that's probably eight feet long, maybe a little bit bigger. <laughs> Meanwhile, my dive buddy is covered head to toe in wetsuit, and I swim up and I grabbed it. She wasn't feeling well, so I grabbed it and I swam it down to my dive buddy, and I placed it in the plastic bag wearing next to nothing. <laughs> sealed it up and handed it to her to take care of. And I said, here you go. And she tried getting a fish out of there and a tentacle came out and hit her in the cheek. <laughs> and the only exposed skin that she had. And so I, we got to go up on the boat and deal with this box jelly sting. And while well, it was supposed to be relaxed, anyway, it was fun. It was, uh, <laughs> it was a box jelly sting. There you go. I've been hit by him at uh, Pro and Hermes. I see them a lot quick, like in San Diego. I see like the tentacles. Yeah. I've seen tentacles that go on the, the one that looks like a fish. Okay. It really freaks me out. We just saw one washed up on shore, but Mark won't believe it. Uh, we saw one washed up on shore at the beach just the other day. Don't be exposed to it. I picked up the Medusa, and it was using Leah, and he said, oh, they can sting you. And I said, no, there's no Medusa fish in there. I picked them up. Okay, fair. <laughs> That's what I didn't believe, but there was a pair of fish. There you go. Yes, Pam. So what's your next phase of your research? Rebreathers. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to, I'd like to take it, take it down to more species level. Um, I, I, I need to write the main community characterization is literally getting submitted, like uh, resubmitted next week. It's already been accepted pending edits. So we've made the edits. It's going in next week, and then that'll be good. Um, I'd like to publish a couple little bits out of here uh, that are little little notes and things that I, I'd like to put in. Um, but then I'd like to, I think the next step is to revisit the surveys and start taking it down more closer to the species level. Um, so taking more samples for the, the Probably, in this case, taking more notes uh, while we're underwater. We kind of got away from that while we were doing but I'd like to get back to that because I found that to be very, very useful, um, not just for that, but also for teaching neuroscience and some of that other stuff. Yes. Is that so good that the, like, like they do sometimes for the reef surveys where they'll do a video record mm -hmm. and they send a transect? Could you be doing video records there instead of having to make do the notes? Because then you could be coming back and analyzing later to figure out what's good and what's good. Okay. And then you could perhaps be doing a lot more sampling. That'd be a great idea. Uh, the, and in fact, so what a lot, one of the things that they do is like these towed camera arrays, and they're able to tow it through the water. And this is one of the things that are going to put me on the job with some of this stuff. Um, they're able to tow the camera through the water, and they've only recently been able to develop algorithms where they can actually take those video strip transects that they get from these cameras and run them through a program and identify every animal through a computer program that they see which is way better than what I can do. Um, but the they only get a snapshot. And if we were to take video, it'd be very difficult to get the focus exactly right enough to get down to uh, species. And it'd be very difficult to get close enough to most of these animals because they're very, very small. So depending on what camera you have, all these, all these photos that I took are very intentionally pointed straight at the animal. Um, but a lot of these animals are 
very, very, very small. So if you're trying to use like a macro lens to just kind of go through the water to count this stuff, you're gonna miss it. You're gonna miss most of it. But that's a that's a great idea and something we can follow up on. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but what the video metric uh, solves is the is the oh wow that's really cool effect. Yes. So your you know your five minute sampling period assumes that it's, it's you know you're not spending any more time right. on any one individual than any other. But I I bet that as a diver you're gonna go wow that's cool. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I haven't seen one of those before. That's true. Spend your whole time looking at that. That's a very good point. Um, yeah, maybe, and so we, you're probably right. We probably should incorporate some form of video into that if we can figure out how to identify the animals specifically. Yeah, definitely. So when you do your surveys of drifting, yes, do you try to account the fact that you're doing your surveys and s subsequent surveys are somewhere else from the original one? So, yeah, we're trying to usually when we're trying to do a surveys, we were trying to stratify. Room at various depths. So you're trying to stay at a, a steady depth level um, in isobat uh, throughout the entire survey, as, as reasonable as you can. So if you start at 40 feet, ideally a good survey, you would end at 40 feet. So if you, if you go out on Tuesday and do a survey, mm -hmm. and then go out and do another survey on Friday, do you, do you try to control the fact that your boat's going to be in a different place? Not really. We did a GPS point. Yeah, we did take a GPS point of all of them. Um, the, the boats varied in location enough that it was, um, we covered an area that was four miles inshore to offshore, a uh, very, very long distance. But furthermore, when you're talking about oceanic things, you're talking about ocean currents constantly mixing this stuff with them. So you're, it's not like you can get, I wouldn't be able to go back out to the same spot the next day and expect to find like fishing boat that I found uh, with the marlin and stuff on there. It wouldn't be anywhere near there the next day or even the next week. And even if it were to go all the way around in the gyre, that gyre will have moved offshore enough so that it would still be another half mile, maybe a mile out, maybe further than that um, by the time it came back. Okay. Yes? Off topic with all these technical questions, but um, have you ever, how many times have you witnessed actually seeing a dolphin squid in front of you so i had one a, a lot a lot uh we had i had one just this winter that was really sad uh i was up at the surface uh, i saw this squid it was a big one it's a, it looks like the purple back flying squid but it's called omastrephi so they're significantly larger it's probably about that big but i might be exaggerating somewhere in there so anyway it was a, it was the biggest squid i had ever personally seen on one of these and I, I swam up to it, and as soon as it saw me, it came over and it stuck right here because the dolphins were just pacing back and forth. <laughs> and then it stayed with me for like five or ten minutes, like just stayed with me for that long. So I got to just hang out with this massive squid until at some point it just must have realized that it couldn't stay with me forever. And it just slowly <laughs> and solemnly swam off into the blackness and disappeared into this huge cloud of ink as the dolphins went after it. So I hope it made it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on a few. You know, yeah. I've seen the, I've seen the little, I've seen the fish eat the little things, the squid eat the fish, but I've yet to see its circle of life. <laughs> it is devastating to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> it probably would have made it if you didn't blind it when you were swimming. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. Thank you, guys.